Turn your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 3. It used to be the most memorized passage of Scripture until people got a hold of Matthew chapter 7. John 3.16 was the most memorized passage of Scripture, and then people chose to say, Judge not, lest ye be judged. And just left it at that. I remember when I first came across this passage of scripture, John 3, 16. I didn't know the Lord. I had been searching for something supernatural most of my life. I believed in God growing up as a Unitarian. I believed that evil was, uh, Satan didn't exist. Evil was just uh, the poor nature of man manifesting itself and everybody went to heaven. And so as I got older, I began to explore into uh, various fields of the supernatural and have since repented of any occultic practices that I had involved myself with. But one thing that was revealed in that time was that there was a supernatural force that was operating beyond what we can see with our temporal eyes. There was something there and it was scary. Even as a lost person, it was scary. And so if I could see evil in this way, then there had to be good. And I began to explore with, uh, uh, I was trying to think of Dianetics. What is that? L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics. What is that, that religion? Scientology. Scientology. Hello. So Scientology was something that I began to explore and uh, was about to uh, seriously consider joining because a coworker of mine was part of that. And then he shared a really weird story with me that made me realize that that's not the answer. Don't know, go into too much detail about it, but the way he explained it to me, I was like, well, that's not going to be the way. When I went into the military on my dog tags, it said Lutheran. And I was not a devout Lutheran. I was not a good Lutheran. I think I just wanted to, I think it sounded cool, actually. Lutheran, yes. But as I was in the military, I remember coming across this. I was in the Mojave Desert. I was attached to some scouts. And I was sitting in a Humvee on this outcropping in uh, in some of the mountains that surround the Mojave Desert. And I was looking into the desert and there was no one there. No one there at all. And I was just to be making observation and reporting what I saw. And I had stolen from a hotel not too long before a little green Gideon Bible. Now they supply those. I think you can just take one. I think it's okay. I didn't know that. I really felt like I was stealing it, but I wanted it. And it was with me, fit easy in my bag. And I began to, to read and I had, I had looked at the Bible. Um, I consider myself a good guy. Even just recently, one of my uh, battle buddies that we've reconnected said, Eric, you were always what would seem to be a good guy. He's been watching some of the messages and, and just made a comment to me. He said, but what the Lord has done in you is amazing because he knew the drunk. He knew that guy. He knew that guy. And that was the good guy. But I'm telling you right now, once the Lord gets a hold of you, changes everything everything. I remember coming across, I was reading John for no apparent reason. And when I came to John three sixteen, it's interesting how this one grabs you. Some would say that John three sixteen is the theme of the Bible, that this is the, if there was going to be one statement that you could make about the Bible, that John three sixteen would be that one for God. So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when I, came around, when I came across this, I remember sitting there and it arrested me. I didn't quite understand what it meant because I never saw how Jesus played a role in this, except that he was some good example that we were going to follow. And so I remember getting back the next day uh, after uh, my time out uh, in the Mojave Desert for training, I told my wife that we need to go to church. I just felt like we needed to. We went to a church called Skyline Baptist Church 
there in Killeen, Texas, right outside of Fort Hood. And my wife gave her life to Christ. And it was a beautiful thing. And I remember going through the motions of getting saved. I didn't fully understand. Nobody explained this to me. They didn't go into great detail of of what God did for me. They just said, pray this prayer. So I prayed the prayer. And they said, you need to get baptized now. So I got baptized. And you should read the Bible. So I read the Bible. It wasn't until about four years later that I actually got saved where I had an encounter with the Lord. And the encounter wasn't seeing him visually, but what he allowed to take place was he allowed me to see me for who I am. You've heard this story before. But it absolutely revolutionized my life so much so that I told my wife that divorce is not an option because we were talking about getting divorced. And and the Lord is doing something. Those are the first times that those words ever came out of my mouth, that the Lord is doing something. Do you have that testimony? Do you have this moment where God arrested you, where he exposed you to you from his eyes, from his point of view, and you surrendered your life to his because you realized that everything that you're doing with your life was a real mess? Well, he did that for me and I'm thankful. In this passage of scripture for God, this God is God the Father. And we could say Abba. Some people have said Daddy. This is the God who created all things. This is the God who is not limited by anything or anyone. Nothing is impossible for God. God spoke into existence everything that we see now and gave us life and gave us breath. And he sustains that life and he sustains that breath today, right now. Every breath that we're taking, he is sovereignly and providentially in control. Do you know this? Do you know that God is uh, is absolutely controlling the destinies of men, the destiny of time. And at the same time, this wonderful God that we serve provides us with what we would call the will to choose, free will. Now, it doesn't mean that the preeminence of God in his uh, providence and in, in all knowing, his uh, omnipotence and his omniscience He is all powerful and knows everything that he knows the decisions that were going to be made in this room before the foundation of time. He is a God that is not limited by anything or anyone. Even time itself is something that he can interject into at any time he wants. This is a powerful God that we serve. This God that is spoken of here for God. What did God do? He loved. He so loved as we read. But in the Greek, when you look at this so loved, it means in this manner. That in this manner, God, this omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, immutable, never changing God when nothing is impossible for him, that he loved in a way, this way. How? I didn't understand this when I first read this, but I'm coming to a better understanding of what God's love is. And he demonstrated this. He said, for God so loved in this manner, the world. He didn't love, it doesn't say, and God loved the earth. God loved the planet. He's not a tree hugger. He made the trees. He can take the trees away. He can put them back just like this. He is God. But he loved the world in the sense that he loved human beings. That's what he's talking about here. This is what the Lord is expressing. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
Now, when you look at John chapter one and you start this, and this is why I had started that that day, I just want to read a few passages of scripture to you. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Then it begins to speak about John who was the forerunner. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might be saved. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. This only begotten son. God so loving us demonstrated in such a way that he sent his only begotten son. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I love this passion. I wanted this message this week and the heaviness of the past few months for us to just reflect on the great love of God demonstrated to us because brothers and sisters, we are blessed. We are blessed with the hope that we have of eternal life. We are blessed with the health that we have, which is by his good hand. We are so blessed for the relationships that we have. Your husband, your wife, the friendships that are true friendships. You know how to determine a true friendship, by the way? It's this. If you share something bad, they don't share something worse that happened to you, to them. <clears throat> They simply come to you and they are there with you in that. And when you share something that great that happened to you, they don't go and say, you know, that's good. But you know what happened to me? This happened to me. It's just a small little litmus test. They should be excited for you and glad for you. I'm telling you right now, it's a beautiful thing when you see somebody give their life to Christ. There is no greater joy. And the great friendship that we have with God comes through his son, that he would lay down his life for us. There is no greater friend. Boy, we're blessed. Amen. Amen. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And in this, he says that whosoever believeth in him, believeth in the Lord, believeth in Jesus Christ, believe in the only begotten son should not perish should not perish. You know, if you continue reading, and I probably should have read this whole thing because it does kind of make a little more sense. But those that believe on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that he, that that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And listen, there is a condemnation. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. It condemns themselves because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. The only reason that we do anything that's good is because of God. The motivation behind what we do in Christ, you see, only thing that motivation is good because of God. 
Because when we're left to ourselves, brothers and sisters, our motivations are evil. They're for ourself. We're very selfish. We're very self-centered and self-focused. And we want the praise and we want the glory. We want the pats on the back. And then all of a sudden the Lord gets a hold of us and we want him to receive the glory. And we begin to pray in ways that we never thought that we would actually speak to anyone about someone else is that they would be blessed even more so than myself. And when they are blessed, we rejoice with them. Hallelujah. And that love is an amazing love. If you're ever interested in how he started this, he's talking with Nicodemus and he's explaining the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is like the wind. You don't know where the Holy Spirit is going or where he comes from, but you can hear and feel and you know that the wind exists in the same way that the Holy Spirit exists in you if you're born again. And Nicodemus is like, well, how can somebody be born again? Can I enter back into my mother's womb? Of course not. You have to be born again. And those that are born twice die once, but those that are only born once die twice. You'll die in this life and you'll have the second death. And he says, and as Moses in verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. This was a a type and a shadow of Jesus Christ in the wilderness as the Israelites were complaining about the manna that they were receiving. They were receiving this manna from heaven and Jesus says, I am the manna from heaven. They were receiving a blessing and they were complaining to Moses and ultimately in that had had really blasphemed God. And God, it says, when you go to Numbers chapter 21, if you look at verses six through nine, and I believe I can read them to you because I put a little pink sticky there. It says, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. Who sent the serpents? God did. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. The confession of sin. What a beautiful thing. I know what that looks like. And it is a beautiful thing when you see repentance. It is a humble spirit. It is a spirit of reconciliation, a desire. It is a confession of sin. So much so, just like when the, uh, the woman at the well, I mean, Jesus said, you know, go get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. He says, rightly so. You've had five. And the one that you're living with now is not your husband. And what did she do when she realized that he was the Messiah? She ran into town confessing her sin before everyone as if it was nothing. It is an amazing thing when repentance truly hits the heart. I remember when I got saved at the top of my stairs, when the Lord revealed who I was, and I remember weeping at the top of the stairs because I saw me for who I was. I wasn't a good guy. I was destroying my marriage. I was drinking way too much. I, I was, I was a, a, a functional alcoholic, if you will. And I remember with tears down my face, walking down the stairs and walking into the kitchen where my wife was. And I said, sweetheart, I've got something to tell you. Get the kids. Now, this looks strange because we're talking about divorce. And I come walking down the stairs crying. And and this doesn't look like the best situation is about to break out. Got the kids down there. And I told my wife, I said, divorce is not an option. Son, were you long? Were you old enough to remember that? No. Man. He was a little one, little bitty guy. And I remember the words that I said, everything that has happened has been my fault. I have been arrogant. I have been pride. I, divorce is not an option. And the Lord is doing something in me and you'll see. I know you don't believe the words. And I don't expect you to believe the words that are coming out of my mouth. But you'll see something's happening. I took some alcohol out of the cabinet and poured it down the drain and hugged my wife. And she was reluctant. Till about three months later, I remember being down at the altar at the church 
And I was telling the Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to do. I will surrender to ministry. I love you, Lord. I'm so thankful that you saved me. And I remember my wife, my wife's hand touching me on the shoulder as she knelt down beside me. And she said, wherever you send him, I'll go. And that beautiful restoration of relationship. It is such a glorious thing to see repentance. Well, we find ourselves here in the Old Testament and they're saying, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looks upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived a picture and a shadow of all of our sins being placed on Christ. And he starts this beautiful theme of the Bible statement in John 3, 16. He starts in John 3, 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. This is an amazing picture of the love of God. I love Jesus. I'm so thankful for what he's done. But this is a demonstration of God the Father's love for us. This demonstration is something beyond what we can really wrap our minds around. And it's such a beautiful thing to catch a glimpse of this. That God gave. He's given us a lot of things. He's given us finances, amen. He's given us a place to worship. He's given us choices. He's given us chances after chances after chances after chances. And he has given us mercy and he has given us grace. You know, when you uh, are gonna pay your rent, you usually get a five-day grace period, right? The abundance of God's grace is so amazing because when we're late after the fifth day, mercy kicks in for his children. And and how we continue to want to even think about violating this blows my mind that he would have the long suffering and patience with us, but he does. His love is like something we can barely comprehend. We are truly blessed, amen? We are blessed. He gave his son. Why? That whoever looks at him, whoever believes in him should not perish. We saw in here that right now in the world, people are already condemned. We're not condemning them by telling them about Jesus, even though that's their perception. Their perception is, oh, you know, I don't have any... There's, there's nothing you tell me about Jesus. And all of a sudden now there's a problem, but I didn't have a problem before. No, no, no. You had a bad problem. You were already condemned. You were perishing. And by the way, brothers and sisters, you and I are perishing as well. This body isn't going to make it. This body is going to perish. This is a corruptible body that we have, and we are going to die one day. And some people don't want it to be torturous. And they don't want it to be this some long suffering. They'd rather just I lay my uh, lay my head down on the pillow and close my eyes. And when I open my eyes with no pain at all, there I am opening my eyes to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, that's that's the way to go. If you're going to go, <laughs> he's like, that's the way I'm trying to light it up. Praise the Lord. Even the suffering that we have in this life is going to pale in comparison to when we open up our incorruptible eyes and behold the face of God. We are going to see uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. 
and there will be this glory that emanates from his throne like something we have never seen that our bodies cannot comprehend, our minds cannot comprehend, our our bodies cannot function apart from God gifting us this ability even. And then it will be glorious to behold him. I'm excited about that day. And most people in the world today have no idea that there are only two options in this world. It is heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ or it is hell prepared for the devil and his angels. I couldn't have planned that. (laughs) I'm telling you, there's a world out there that needs to know about Christ. If I were a missionary and I was being transplanted somewhere with this team right now assembled, I would be blessed because most missionaries, when they go off, it's them alone or them and their wife or maybe some kids if they have them. And everything has to be created by winning souls and discipling men and women up for the ministry and then continue that expansion in that area. So once again, brothers and sisters, we are blessed in this house. Amen. We are blessed in this house. If we ever thought about starting uh, over, starting afresh, if this is what God has given us, then we are truly blessed beyond some of the greatest missionaries that have gone with just their families. We are blessed. I hope you see that we're blessed by God. Amen. Amen. And we are blessed with this word, this message, this theme. This is the, the crux of everything that we want to do. And that is to understand God's immense love for them, even if they are a sin, uh, a sinners, which they are. They don't realize it. But he loved us yet while we were sinners. He loved me then. I was a wretch. You were a wretch. Some of you are wretches, right? A few of you. <laughs> we are so, so blessed. You know, the Lord speaks a lot about hell. He speaks about hell more than he speaks about heaven. There's so much about heaven that we don't actually know. I was thinking that there is a heaven beyond this book that that as it's explained through the millennial reign and then Satan has his opportunity to go out and people are still going to turn to him. And then there's going to be this final end all it's over and then you go into eternity beyond what we know and it is going to be beyond anything that we could comprehend it's why he doesn't explain it we're just not going to get it and that is our destiny brothers and sisters are we not blessed do you not see this if it doesn't bring joy to your heart if it doesn't put a smile on your face i don't know what will There is no greater gift that has been given to us than the love of God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amazing. Amazing. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. Well, I don't want to make this a a long message, but I remember when someone kind of led me down the Romans road and it was simple words. And I know this is a very simple message, but they showed me in God's word where it says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, everyone. And then they asked me some questions to prove it. Have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen anything? The answer to those things were yes, even if they were small. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Then you committed adultery. Have you ever hated somebody without a cause? Then you have murdered them. Have you ever used the Lord's name as a filthy curse word? Then you've blasphemed the name of God. And that imperfection will find no home in heaven. And then shared how Jesus, making the connection how Jesus had done that for us. I don't talk a lot about these kind of things because they haven't happened often. 
But I remember sitting in a service one time and a man called me up out of the audience. And I just share this with you. The Lord, if he, if, if he's never, if he's never done this with you, it's okay. If he does it in the future with you, it will be a blessing. He may do something else. God is so amazing that he will gift you with the things that he wants you to have when it's time in his timing. We are his vessels. So this isn't to boast at all, except that he allowed me to see something that I had never captured in my own mind. But this man had called me up and he told me that I was going to pastor one of God's churches. And in that instant, I don't remember what he said beyond that because I was standing up in in a group larger than this in the middle and the Lord opened my, my eyes to something. And I'll just share it this way and, and explain because this was what you would call an open vision and a very strange thing for me. Miracles happen, by the way. God does miracles. Amen. They come from his hand. And for me, in my heart, this was something that I needed. But from from above, a drop came down and it was a drop that, that revealed to me how great the chasm is from where I am to having any relationship with God. It was an impassable gulf. It was something that could not be stretched across. It was me on this side, impassable, and he was way on the other side. It was absolutely impossible, and it was hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. So much so that I started crying in an instant in the hopelessness of reaching God. It was not attainable. It was not attainable, and it was scary, and it was dark, and it was hopeless, just the feeling, I don't think any of us have, have really felt the feeling of hopeless. And I know that I thought that I did until I saw this. Hopeless means there's absolutely no way now, tomorrow, or ever. And I started to cry. And the Lord didn't leave me in that because a drop fell down and it was the joy of the Lord. It it hit me right here on the top of the head. It was the strangest thing. It's never happened again. It doesn't ever need to happen again. (laughs) It has opened my eyes to a reality that in that one drop and the joy, what I saw was that Jesus made a way. What was impossible for me was not impossible for God. And he showed his great love and that Jesus crossed the chasm, closed the gap and made it possible that I would have a relationship with God, that hopelessness was no longer an option, that it was full of hope, full of joy. And I began to laugh. And in that, I opened my eyes or came to something. It just... uh, I was a little embarrassed to some degree, but not as embarrassed as the beginning because when it first happened, I could feel the crumpling of my legs when the hopelessness was setting in. And I remember telling myself, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this weird thing. It's not going to happen. And the Lord just kind of pressed down and showed me that you don't have any say. I am God when he showed me that hopelessness. So this is this message. People don't realize, but the sad thing is the hopelessness that people will experience because they're already condemned, right? When they enter into the presence of God, regardless of their arguments, regardless of their rebukes, regardless of of how they treated you or what they said about you or that you're weird or ignorant or whatever it is, When they stand before the Lord in that moment, he will expose to them the hopelessness that they were already condemned in because they did not believe in the only son of God, Jesus. Now we know that. They don't know that. So this should be the message of our heart. This is God's heart for the world. 
He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, regardless of color, regardless of status, regardless of your political affiliations, regardless of any of those things, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Is that not a beautiful, beautiful statement that God has made for us? Now, there's a, a story that I'm going to close with, and uh, I hope you can appreciate it. I found this, and I would love to commit it to memory, but it's kind of a picture of his love for us. If we can really grab hold of the love of God, then we'll go out there and tell people how to, to bridge the chasm. And it's not anything that I can do. It's only something that Jesus can do. And we will do it willingly, regardless of the rebuke. And we'll do everything to stand against every high thing that presents itself against the knowledge of who God is. We will arrest every thought, taking it captive in obedience to Christ. We will do everything to stand and then stand if we can get our minds wrapped around a small fraction of God's love for the world. He's made the provision. And then somehow, some way, you and I have been commissioned as ministers of reconciliation to be ambassadors for his kingdom, to bring this message of hope and eternal life through Jesus Christ. The God of the universe, me? I, I would have done it differently. But is that not a blessing to us to be that witness for him? So let me read this. This is a, a story of a, of a sermon of a church service and said, after a few of the usual Sunday evening hymns, the church's pastor slowly stood up, walked over to the pulpit, and before he gave his sermon for the evening, briefly introduced a guest minister who was in the service that evening. In the introduction, the pastor told the congregation that the guest minister was one of his dearest childhood friends and that he wanted him to have a few moments to greet the church and share whatever he felt would be appropriate for the service. With that, the elderly gentleman stepped up to the pulpit and he began to speak. A father and his son and a friend of his son were sailing off the Pacific coast, he began, when a fast storm blocked any attempt to get back to the shore. The waves were so high even though the father was an ex, uh, experienced sailor, he could not keep the boat upright and the three were swept into the ocean as the boat capsized. The old man hesitated for a moment, making eye contact with two teenagers who were for the first time since the service began looking somewhat interested in his story. The aged minister continued with his story. Grabbing a rescue line, the father had to make the most excruciating decision of his life. To which boy would he throw the end of the lifeline? He had only seconds to make the decision. The father knew that his son was a Christian, and he also knew that his son's friend was not. And the agony of his decision could not be matched by the torrent of waves. As the father yelled out, I love you, son, he threw out the lifeline to his son's friend. By the time the father had pulled the friend back to the capsized boat, his son had disappeared beneath the raging swells into the black night. His body was never recovered. The old man said sadly. By this time, the two teenagers were sitting up straight in their pews, anxiously awaiting for the next words to come out of the old man's mouth. The father, he continued, knew his son would step into eternity with Jesus and he could not bear the thought of his son's friends stepping into an eternity without Jesus. Therefore, he sacrificed his son to save the son's friend. How great is the love of God that he should do the same for us. Our heavenly father sacrificed his only begotten son so that we could be saved. 
I urge you to accept the offer to rescue you and take hold of the lifeline he is throwing out to you in this service. With that, the old man turned and sat back down in his chair and silence filled the room. The pastor again walked slowly to the pulpit and delivered a brief sermon with an invitation at the end. However, no one responded to the appeal. But within moments after the service ended, the two boys were at the old man's side. That was a nice story, politely stated one of the boys, but I don't think it was very realistic for a father to give up his only son's life in hopes that the other would become a Christian. Well, you've got a point there, the old man replied, glancing down at his old worn Bible. As a big smile broadened his face, his narrow face, he looked up at the boys and said, it sure isn't very realistic, is it? But I'm here today to tell you this story gives me a glimpse of what it must have been like for God to give up his only son for me. You see, I was that father and your pastor is my son's friend. How beautiful and how glorious is the father's love for us. I want you to leave today knowing that you're blessed. And if you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that today. Father, you've made it very simple for us to have this relationship with you. If we would truly believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths, that you are the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved. This doesn't come without a recognizing of our sinfulness and our desperate need for a savior because we can't save ourselves. To turn from those things and to turn to you and to you alone, trusting in you for all things, for all eternity. Lord, there are no words that I can encourage someone to speak to you, but Lord, that their hearts would cry out to you in desperation, that they would in fact repent and turn and say, I am a sinner. I have sinned before you, O oh God. I need a savior. Come into my life, Lord Jesus, and save me. For those of us who have had a long-standing relationship with you, Lord, I pray that you would rekindle in our heart, your heart, your heart for the lost. Lord, if your kingdom is to grow, it will grow from the saving of souls. Satan loses by attrition. So Lord, I pray that you would instill in our hearts that wonderful proverb, Proverb 1130, that the fruit, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and those that win souls are wise. We want to be wise before you, Lord, and we ask for your continued blessing. If we have not expounded on the blessings that would create in us a manifestation of gratitude and thanksgiving, Lord, I pray that you would begin that now. We are truly, truly blessed. And we owe it all to you. And we give you all the glory and all the praise because you're worthy. And it's in your mighty and the matchless, and the magnificent name of Jesus we pray. And God's people said, amen, amen. amen. amen.